Can I just hit that? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our November Farm Talk Breakfast program. We have Farm Talk Breakfast every third Friday of the month. That's my oven timer for our muffins that I wish I could share with you. Every third Friday at 8.30 in the morning, we have this program. Usually we have it in person and we converse over uh, breakfast about a current event or widely uh, interesting topic. And for this month's Farm Talk Breakfast, we are going to take a virtual dairy tour. We have some of the people who were part of making, uh, creating and offering that tour with us. But the first thing we're going to do today is talk a little bit about an invasive species that should be on everyone's radar. And that is the spotted lantern fly. It's been in the news a lot lately because we did have our first confirmed um, sighting of spotted lantern fly. They did find uh, some spotted lantern flies in Jefferson County. That's not too awful far from us. We know how people tend to move throughout the state um, and people on the eastern side tend to travel on the eastern side. So we need to be looking for this pest. If we spot it, we need to be reporting it to the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Uh, you can also call and report to your county extension educator and they'll get you to the right place. What you wanna do is take a picture of it and then squish it. We don't want any live samples. We want them to be dead, um, but then save the, the squished parts uh, so that we can get confirmation that it is in fact spotted lantern fly. And with that, I'm going to share my screen and show you a catchy video to help you remember what to do with spotted lantern fly if you see it. So get, bear with me one second while I share my screen. I saw a spotted lantern fly climbing up a vine And then another bunch of them were chewing on my pine Across the street and alley, it wasn't a big surprise That the neighbors were all stomping, stomping lantern flies Stomping, stomping, stomping lantern flies I mixed some soap and water, I grabbed my credit card I'm scraping eggs and spraying around the whole house and the yard. I take a towel and whack them and they aim right for my eyes. But I go right on stomping, stomping lantern flies. Stomping, stomping, stomping lantern flies. My mama always told me to love all living things. But I bet mama never met these bugs with spotted wings. I'm gonna keep on stomping till the last one finally dies. I'm stomping, stomping, stomping lantern flies. Stomping, stomping, stomping lantern flies. Ugh. Okay, I hope that that was enjoyable for you guys. <laughs> I think it's a pretty catchy tune. At this point now, um, I did want to mention that the preferred host plant for spotted lantern fly is Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive tree. Uh, so we should be watching stands of Tree of Heaven that we know exist um, for populations of spotted lantern fly. But that's not the only tree that they're attracted to. They do um, inhabit a wide variety of trees that are in our forests, so put that one on your radar. How now, I can't move to X thing? excuse me, my daughter is helping me with this morning's uh, session. At this point, I'd like to ask the creators of our video if they would give a little introduction to how, why, and where the video um, has been shared so far. Okay. 
Cheryl, did you want to start or I can? Um, this is Mary Beth Albright. Um, I'm one of the um, owners, I guess, of Albright jerseys that you'll be seeing on the video. Uh, before the this year's virtual farm science review, um, they put out a call for, um, I guess, proposals for those that may be interested in doing virtual tours uh, for especially geared at youth. And uh, Cheryl and I, um, Cheryl from down, um, down south in southern Ohio, I'm up north, uh, we both put in similar proposals uh, for virtual tours of robotic dairy farms. So when they reviewed the proposals, they said, hey, maybe you guys can work together and uh, produce one video um, about um, a couple different robotic dairies. Um, so that's what we did. Um, I am the guilty one um, about roping um, Jason Harchu, who's in the call, into helping. Um, Jason's an ag educator um, up my way and has a lot of dairy background and knowledge. And I also knew he had some better video recording equipment and some experience with producing videos. So I roped uh, Jason and a, a fellow ag educator, Mike Gasteyer, into coming out to the farm to, to help produce our video. Um, let's see, uh, of course it was, um, was used for the farm science review. Um, we had a nice session with a lot of youth um, from across the state that joined and hopefully many more that perhaps have reviewed the recording of the video. And I don't know if even uh, Cheryl knows this, but I'll be using clippets from the video to do a, uh, uh, I guess a, a, a virtual dairy tour feature for Ross County um, and their 4-H clubs um, here in a few weeks. So Cheryl, I'm not sure if you've used the video anywhere else or not. Um, not a lot of places, I guess, but um, just as Mary Beth said, you know, we normally I'm part of this uh, STEM design team for 4-H and uh, across the state. And so every year at Farm Science Review, we have uh, a STEM and Ag tent where a lot of you might have seen if you've gone to the Farm Science Review that kids can come in and do some hands-on activities and things. And so that was the challenge this year, of course, is how to uh, make that virtual and make it meaningful for kids. And so there were some hands-on demonstrations that were recorded and things as well as these virtual tours like we were talking about. Um, and the Workman family uh, that is featured on the Monroe County part of the um, video. Leslie used to work in our extension office as a uh, program coordinator and so we'd had the opportunity to go out and see her robotic dairy farm and you know thought that was just a pretty awesome thing that a lot of people don't get a chance to see and um, you know robotic dairy farms are not a very big percentage of uh, the dairy operations probably happening in the United States and so just thought this would be an, a great opportunity for people to, to get a first-hand look at how these robotic dairy farms work. Um, and as far as sharing here, we've uh, shared it over social media and uh, had a lot of people watch it that way. And then um, I know our local 4 or FFA um, classes have shown it in their um, classrooms as well. And so that's the, the nice thing I think about the virtual format is that, you know, it is available online so that it can be used in classrooms and 4-H clubs or, you know, whatever uh, settings other people might want to use it in, as Mary Beth mentioned. And, you know, they're doing a countywide uh, showing of it in Ross County, so, um, or parts of it that Mary Beth's involved with. So, um, you know, it's, it reaches a lot more people probably than what it would have during the Farm Science Review, which is kind of a neat thing. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us for Farm Talk Breakfast this morning. Uh, we'll ask that everybody uh, compile questions throughout the video and save them for the end. And we'll have a, a distinct question answer time. So if you have questions that weren't answered in the video, you'll have the opportunity to ask those at the end. Also a note, when I share my screen, um, it's going to share the audio settings from my phone. So if it is too loud on your end, just turn it down um, on your computer. If I play it too soft, it'll be soft for everyone. So um, I'm gonna play it fairly loud on my end and then go ahead and adjust it on your computer to your liking. I'm going to go ahead and share and we will start our virtual tour.
Hi, I'm Emily Smith and I'm the 2020 Monroe County Junior Fair Queen and today we are doing a virtual tour of two robotic dairy farms. All right, welcome everybody to the Farm Science Review. Today we're at Albright Jersey Dairy Farm and they're going to be giving us a little bit of background information on the farm's history right now and how they got to where they are. Um, they're milking with Lely robots. It's very exciting, the technology that's available in agriculture and all the careers that are available and how that changes the way farmers manage the farm and utilize the data they can utilize coming off of all this technology. And Joel, would you like to give us a little bit of background on how you got to where you are today, the farm's history, and what you have here on the robotics side? Our farm is a family farm that uh, started milking Jersey cows in 1947 uh, when my grandfather came home from the service. Uh, my grandfather, Alan, milked cows originally in a 32 stall tie stall barn. Uh, in 1977, uh, they built a free stall barn and a herringbone parlor. Um, in 2002, we stretched that parlor to a double eight. And then in 2011, we went to a, a double 16 Parabone parlor. And uh, in 2018, we started up our uh, Lely robots. Originally, they milked uh, about 100 cows uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we grew closer to 200 cows in the 90s. And uh, we've grown all the way up to close to 600 cows milking at this point. You would mentioned, Joel, that this is a family operation. Would you like to introduce your family that you're going to have helping us here today, talking about some of the robotics? Okay, so today uh, my wife Mary Beth Albright and Lauren Albright will be a part of our video. We also have a son, Luke, um, who wasn't able to be here today, but he's uh, eight, going on nine. Um, Miss Lauren just completed her second year of 4-H in Huron County. All right, thanks, Joel. What led you in the direction of going to the robotics that we're going to be moving on to look at and talk about? Our facilities uh, were at a point where uh, they didn't have a lot of life left in them and uh, we were at a, a point where we had to really consider all of our options whether we were going to build a new parlor, uh, utilize robots, or exit the dairy industry. We chose robots primarily um, to utilize some technology, um, make some progress in some areas on our dairy farm that we felt like we could grow and get better at. Um, our labor situation was always challenging uh, to find plenty of people that wanted to be a part of a dairy farm and be a part of our team. Uh, so having robots gave us an opportunity to have a smaller workforce and uh, try to utilize um, a group of people that really enjoyed being around cows. I'm Jason Workman, this is my wife Leslie. Uh, we're at our dairy farm, Blue Sky Farm. It's been in my family since, uh, I guess, my great-great-grandpa. So we'd be the fifth generation uh, farming it. Um, we took over from my dad uh, two and a half years ago, um, I served in the Army for a little while, and for six years, and whenever we come back, uh, we come back and wanted to, to farm and raise our family on the farm, so we come back here and uh, started farming with my dad uh, for a year after we got back, and then we uh, took over, built this barn last year. Uh, actually, a year ago, next week, next week uh, we started milking in this facility. Uh, with a robot. Before that, we had an old barn that was built in the 70s uh, and milked in a, in a uh, double seven herringbone parlor. Uh, at our farm here, we milk 60 head, roughly, a brown Swiss, um, fully registered herd. Uh, I guess the reason we st stuck with Swiss, really, we didn't choose them. Uh, Grandpa chose them. And uh, we just kept the Swiss breed. Dad's always loved the Swiss and uh, I grew up with them. Um, Leslie grew up with Holsteins and I've worked on other farms with Holsteins. We kind of just went with the Swiss because that's what we had. Um, in my mind some people argue with you that Swiss aren't as good as Holsteins. 
I think that uh, a good cow is a good cow, whether it's black and white, brown, whatever color it is. Uh, so we stuck with the Swiss and uh, also kind of want to push them. A lot of times Swiss are just thought of as a show cow and uh, I want to see what we can do on the commercial side with them. Why did you guys make the transition to robots and what was the transition like? One of the main reasons that uh, we were leaning towards robots and uh, started looking into it in the first place is because uh, we wanted to raise our family on a farm and we saw how much time growing up that it took up and we we wanted to have a little bit more uh, flexibility and freedom uh, raising our kids on the farm. So uh, the robot in general has just freed up a lot of hours that we normally would have spent in the parlor um, milking where we can use that time to do other things on the farm, better manage things. Uh, the technical information that we get from the robot, uh, i.e. cow health, uh, milk quality, uh, things like that, that some people can have in a parlor system. Uh, we didn't have it in ours. Uh, and instead of updating to where we had all that, um, we took advantage of what we got with the robot for that information, uh, as well as the time freedom and, and uh, just having that flexibility to be able to go work on something else, if it be making feed or something. Uh, like that, we weren't set to a 12 and 12 milking schedule or uh, being tied to that parlor for four to six hours a day. Uh, when we, as he said earlier, we are coming up on our one year anniversary of uh, milking in this facility. And thinking back to that, we had, a, I would say, a fairly easy transition. I, I think he would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of people sometimes try to do like pre-training and all that. We were bringing our cows in from another facility, so it was they showed up in this barn and we immediately started uh, pushing them through the robot. Um, so we have all brown Swiss and they tend to be a little more nosy and a little more curious, which I think uh, definitely helped us out with our transition. Um, by the second day, some of them were already going through on their own. Um, we had help, you know, pushing the cows and everything for the first few days. And then we were on our own and they, they took really well to it. Um, every now and then we'll get a stubborn one, but for the most part, they, they've all really adapted very well to it. Another thing that helped make the transition a lot smoother was all the, the neighbors that chipped in. Uh, Emily's family helped us out. Uh, her dad and her uncle both came over. Uh, some of our friends came over and helped us push cows. Uh, WG Dairy, their techs stayed here around the clock uh, for the first four, three days, three days. Three days. Um, and they were m monitoring our system the whole time. Um, once they did leave uh, for weeks, uh, they watched it, monitored it, let us know if something was up, called and checked in on us. Uh, so we, we had a lot of help. The cows played a big role in making it simple, but uh, we also had a lot of neighbors that helped us out. How has the robot changed your daily routine? Uh, the robot, having the robot itself has definitely changed what our normal like day-to-day -day looks like. Um, everybody kind of has the mindset when they think of a dairy farm, you know, you're up at the crack of dawn um, milking the cows. We used to, you know, we always had to be in the parlor at 4.30 and 4.30. Um, now the cows are getting milked while we're sleeping. So um, we, you know, get to sleep in a little bit later in the mornings, maybe if we want. Um, we get up, we have well, like an hour between feeding and doing just normal um, everyday kind of maintenance things on the robot, um, feeding calves and all that stuff, probably about two hours, yeah. two hours in the morning and maybe a little less than that in the evening. So versus in a parlor when you're doing all that, you're looking at maybe six, six hours a day, depending on how many cows you're milking. Um, definitely freed him up a lot more because you don't have to stop in the evenings when you're doing field work because the cows are continuing to be milked while you're out, you know, making hay or whatever. So that has definitely helped us out a lot. is kind of the whole brains behind the robot. Um, this is where this screen right here is going to give us all of the technology or all of the information that this technology provides. Um, so it's empty right now, but uh, when a cow comes in, it'll pull up all of her information. 
um, they walk into this box here and there's actually a scale on the floor so that helps us keep tabs on their weight um, which can also help us pick up on um, illnesses and things faster um, this arm will move and go you know underneath the bird basically it's doing everything that a person would do if they were in a parlor milking um, as far as um, prepping the udder um, we got brushes here it's gonna brush their teeth off um, I think it does two cycles of spray two different kinds of spray um, it'll spray them when they're done so post dip versus um, in a traditional parlor you'll see people using this um, that's just one more thing that it already does for you so for a cow to get milked in a robot a lot of things have to happen number one the cow has to be identified um, this power You'll notice every cow when they come through the robot, they're going to be wearing a collar. And it has several parts. Uh, the, the most important part probably is the transponder. Um, this transponder uh, is used uh, to ID the cow when she comes in. Every cow is going to have a unique ID. Um, and there's a tag reader in the front of the robot that identifies the cow as she comes in. Um, this tag reader, or this transponder serves several other purposes. Um, it has a pedometer, um, and it also tracks rumination. Uh, so this collar has to be oriented uh, so that the transponder is on the left side of the cow at about the 11 o'clock position, um, so that when the cow is laying, it can tell when it rocks back and forth and it actually counts rumination minutes. Um, and we can track each cow's uh, digestive health just by rumination. Um, this weight at the bottom of the collar helps keep this transponder oriented where we need it to be. So when a cow enters the robot, first she's ID'd, and uh, each cow um, has teat coordinates that are known uh, from a seven day average. Uh, the brush arm here will make two passes uh, for a USA wash cleaning cycle. Um, it'll brush each teat based off that teat coordinate average. Um, now you're seeing the brushes being cleaned with a uh, food grade sanitizer with, which is uh, paracetic acid and peroxide mix uh, in a water solution. Um, after the teeth are uh, sanitize the second time you'll see an air blow on each teat to help dry them our two pass brush system is set up to uh, hit about a minute and 30 seconds from touch to attach which is ideal for milk wet down and stimulation uh, once the teats have been prepped um, you're going to see the scanner scan each of the teats um, once the coordinates are found, uh, the, the robot will attach each teat, uh, starting in the rear and working to the front.
So when a cow gets milked, uh, the milk automatically comes from here and is pumped into this jar. And then depending on whether that cow goes to the main bulk tank where our milk is stored till it's picked up by a hauler, or if it, she's had antibiotics or a fresh cow, meaning that we don't want her milk going into that tank and contaminating the other milk, uh, this jar, it'll be stored in this jar and then when she's all done, uh, it sends that milk to its destination. So it'll go down the, through here into this pipeline and if we want to use it for calves, if she's been had antibiotics, she's treated, or if she's a fresh cow, we want the colostrum to feed our calves. It goes into these buckets on the wall over here, um, and we can come in and, and get that milk to feed the calves. Uh, if she's treated and we don't want that milk, it'll put it down the drain. And uh, if she's a normal cow and she's gone into the bulk tank, uh, it'll pump that milk out and um, up into this line here, which runs all the way down our barn and over into our milk house and into the bulk tank where it's stored uh, for two days, um, well, a day and a half. And then we have a truck driver that comes, picks our milk up with the rest of the dairy farmers in the county and takes it uh, down to United Dairy in Martins Ferry. Each robot has a display screen. Uh, there's going to be a variety of information that we can see at the robot about an individual cow. Um, we feed two different pellets to the robots. We feed a 20% commodity pellet, and then we also top dress uh, with a second pellet that's got some bypass protein and uh, other goodies to uh, drive high-end milk production. Um, we see some numbers here on our progress. That would be the time uh, expected in the box for this cow. Uh, we also see the progress by quarter of how much milk flow the cow is having. And uh, like I said before, when the cows get to 45% of peak milk flow in each quarter, it'll detach each quarter. Another kind of advantage of the collars is um, with the breeding, it's helped us get cows pregnant faster. Uh, and a cow's lactation cycle whenever she calves is when she starts milking. Uh, usually they'll milk pretty heavy um, up until about 150, 160 days uh, and then they'll start to drop off. So for us to keep cows milking we want to get them pregnant so that we can uh, turn them dry and let them have kind of a vacation uh, to, to come back into milk after they calve. Um, and for a dairy farm, you ideally want your whole herd to average their days in milk around 150. And uh, we struggled before to get our, our herd there. And uh, now we're starting to get down. Um, right now we're at 200 days in milk. We're still, uh, a year is kind of not long enough to bring that back to where we want it. Uh, so next year at this time, I expect to see us down around 180 or lower uh, and keep getting back closer to that 150. Um, year round and, and maintain it at, at, at that. Going from the parlor to robots, you get a lot of data that comes in. What are the important parts of that data that you, you, you utilize off of the computer? What do they tell you and how do you use them? So one of the things that um, is unique about our upgraded milking systems um, that can be utilized either in a new parlor uh, with IDs and milk weights and uh, collars or uh, in a robotic system is that you can have um, KPIs which are key performance indicators um, in a robotic system. Some of the KPIs that we look at every day uh, would be uh, milkings per cow, uh, production. Uh, we look pretty close at refusals and failures. Uh, refusals are how many times the cows try to get milked, or, uh, but it's not um, time for them to get milked uh, based off of our milk access settings. And uh, failures would be how many uh, cows uh, try to get milked that the robots can't milk. Um, looking at those failures every day will give you an indication on which uh, robots need the most attention and maintenance and uh, can help you be more efficient with your box time and uh, overall harvest of milk per box. Some other key performance indicators that, that we look at um, would be box time. Um, 
at the end of the day, box time is uh, a pretty valuable commodity in a robot system. It's going to affect how many cows that can be milked and uh, how many uh, pounds of milk can be harvested uh, per robot. And those become some of the metrics that affect the uh, cost of production in a robotic milking system. Another key performance indicator would be free time. Uh, free time is uh, the amount of time that the robot sits idle um, in a robotic milking system. When you drop below 10% free time, uh, you're going to start becoming counterproductive, uh, meaning that your number of cows that you have to fetch and get through the robot so that they get milked um, is going to go up. The uh, number of milkings per cow is going to go down and uh, at some point you're just not going to be able to deal with any breakdowns or downtime uh, without having negative effects on overall milk production. Uh, some of the key indicators that are useful uh, for managing cow health would be rumination minutes. Uh, we monitor rumination minutes uh, to uh, get an overall idea of how the, the health of our cows is going. Uh, whenever we have ration changes, uh, that's a good opportunity to uh, evaluate those decisions that were made and adjustments and uh, decide if they are going to put your cows in a spot where eventually you're going to start having some health issues. Uh, related to uh, ration changes. What kind of data does the robot record about your cows? So this is the home screen that you're seeing here on our computer. Uh, when we come to the barn in the mornings or after we haven't been here uh, during the day like when we come in for evening chores, the first thing we look at is this screen here. Uh, the number on the left is the last 24 hour average um, or total uh, for this example right here, total milk production, that's how much milk uh, in pounds was produced from this robot uh, in the last 24 hours. Uh, the parentheses number is um, the actual seven day average, the last seven day average. So this looks like uh, dials. Uh, some people always ask whenever they come, well is red bad or is green good? You know, what's, what's all that telling you? Um, and it is kind of overwhelming when you first come in here until you learn uh, what all the information is telling you. Uh, sometimes if you're clear up in the green, it's, uh, it'll be, it's good for you, but it's just the, the collars are just showing what the last 24 hours are compared to the last seven day average. Uh, one thing that was actually alarming today and, and uh, yesterday we had preventive maintenance on the robot so it was shut down for several hours uh, and that caused us to have a little bit of trouble. Um, you see here it says failures. Failures are when a cow comes in to be milked and for whatever reason she does not get fully milked, whether it be it, the robot doesn't attach to her properly or there's a problem and it doesn't milk out a quarter on her. Uh, it'll, it'll label her as a failure. Um, as you can see, we were down at six for seven days. The last 24 hours, we went up to 17. Uh, a lot of that is due to the being shut down. The cows come in with more milk in their udders and the robot has a little bit of trouble finding those teats. Um, when those cows have full, full or udders uh, compared to what it's used to uh, when they're coming in. Um, and actually that's one thing back to uh, WG Dairies who installed our robot. They actually called me today. Uh, like I said before, they monitor our system all the time. Um, and they actually called me today and wanted to know what was going on if I saw this and uh, if I knew why it was doing that. So uh, we, we uh, identified some stuff and, and then we go in and, and can can fix it. Our nutritionists, the cows are fed a balanced diet to help them maximize their milk production and components. Our nutritionists actually helped us set up some groups so that we can pull up our fresh cows, our zero to 30 days in milk cows, and get an idea just quickly if they're going in the right direction or not. You want to see those cows continue to go up. Uh, today, in the last 24 hours, those cows are at 86.1 pounds. Um, the last seven day average, they were at 71. So they're headed in the right direction. It helps us quickly diagnose if there's problems with our fresh cow protocols or with the, the ration. 
another uh, report that the robot gives us that I like to look at is this uh, cow daily production. Um, it just gives us a little bit more information so we can identify if there's an X in this column. Uh, we can quickly glance down through and find if there's an X that shows cow's production is too low for that day, meaning that her percentage of deviation or the difference between what she normally gives in a 12 hour or 24 hour period is, is a, a considerable amount lower uh, to quickly identify maybe if something's wrong with her. Sometimes if a cow is uh, in heat, she's more active, she doesn't go eat as much. Uh, that could cause that, or a cow that's getting sick, or a cow that's lame, has a sore foot. Uh, a lot of times we can pick them up here uh, very quickly uh, and get the problem solved. Uh, this column here gives us our total programmed feed. The robot gives them a pellet uh, in addition to what they get out at the feed bunk. Uh, the pellet just gives them a little bit more energy and protein, um, and it's balanced based off of their days in milk and based off of how much milk they're giving, so we're not wasting feed. Uh, this column here gives us our rest feed, so that's the feed that the cow actually leaves in the robot. Um, the fresh cows, we don't want to see them leaving very much in the robot. We want to see them cleaning that up. Uh, as they go up in days in milk, you'll see that their amount that they're fed continues to go up. So we want to see that they're, they're following that. They're eating as much as we're allowing them to have. Uh, over here in this column, we have our days pregnant. Uh, we can quickly just pull up if we have a question about a cow or wonder what's going on with the cow. We can find out uh, how many days pregnant she is uh, and go from there on management decisions. Uh, the column over here is our fat and protein indications. Um, those are two components of milk. Uh, Brown Swiss are typically known for having higher butter fat and higher protein, uh, which we get paid uh, a little bit more money for our milk for that. Uh, this column here gives the ratio between the two on our fresh cows. Um, I actually just started learning to use this a little, a little better. Our fresh cows can get metabolic disorders that will decrease the amount of milk that they're giving. Uh, one of those disorders is called ketosis and uh, this fat and protein ratio directly correlates with ketosis. So if it goes up above 1.5 we know that they're getting ketosis and we can treat them um, more quickly, uh, we call it clinical and subclinical. Uh, clinical being they actually have physical signs of ketosis. Uh, subclinical meaning that you don't, you can look at the cow and you can't identify it uh, just by looking at her uh, unless you pull blood on her or this report actually gives us that. Uh, we were pulling blood samples on our cows uh, every couple days after they were fresh and watching uh, what their le BHB levels were uh, and trying to identify ketosis that way and, and after we got this report set up and I learned to use it a little better uh, I don't have to take the time to pull the blood uh, I can come in here look at this report and find out hey do I need to treat that cow for ketosis or not uh, and, and by identifying it subclinically versus clinically we can treat them with uh, just propylene glycol versus an IV uh, get them back on their feet faster a lot of times we don't even have to IV cows for ketosis or other uh, fresh cow problems. We can identify it quickly, get them treated uh, with a minimal amount of, of medicine uh, or supplements and uh, get them back into production or max out their capabilities. Uh, this is just another report that we sometimes use to identify uh, areas that we can improve in management. Uh, this tells us our milkings per hour so we kind of get an idea um, from the cows when they're using the robot the most and when we're interfering with that. Um, so down here you have your hour of the day, so this would be midnight and this would be 11 o'clock at night. And here you have your successful milkings, meaning how many cows actually were milked in the robot in that hour. Um, the robot shuts down to clean three times a day. We can identify that. It shuts down at one o'clock. Cows, you can't get as many milkings. It's shut down for at least 20 minutes, so we see a drop there. It shuts down again at nine and it shuts down again at five to wash. So we see those always drop down. We run our feed out between eight and nine o'clock every morning. We try to time it so that whenever the robot's washing, the cows can be over there eating and utilize the time that they have to actually go to the robot. Um, so that's why you'll see a little bit of a decrease here. Um, but what we found, what was interesting is our cows actually are most active at 11 o'clock at night. Um, they're coming in six and a half times, uh, or six and a half milkings at 11 o'clock at night. So one thing that that tells us is uh, when we're not in the barn, 
is when the cows are using the robot the most. Uh, whenever we come in in the mornings, at like 7 o'clock we show up, we push cows that haven't been to the robot. The robot will let us know, here's your collect list, meaning cows that haven't been to the robot um, in a certain amount of time, whatever that time be according to their uh, days of milk. I said whenever we time the way we feed, we time it so that when the cows are at the bunk eating, the robot's washing, so we're not interfering with that. At that same time, we also scrape stalls uh, and put fresh bedding in uh, and scrape the crossovers so that we're not interfering with those cows. What are other types of features that you built into your barn? Uh, when we designed our barn, we tried to design it with as many efficiencies in mind as we could, as well as cow comfort. Uh, as you see here, we put alley scrapers in. Uh, our scrapers are set to run every hour. Uh, just to keep the manure out of the alley, it helps keep the cows cleaner. Uh, we tried running them uh, a little less often than that, and uh, the cows would lay in the stalls, we'd get their tails in uh, wet, sloppy manure, and then sling it all over their sides and their udders. So we found that turning it up to run every hour actually is helping us out at keeping the cows cleaner. Um, you can also notice that we put water beds in. Uh, cow comfort is a huge huge thing to us so we try to uh, do whatever we can to make the cow as comfortable as possible and to take care of her as, and, and help uh, keep cows around longer. Um, whenever we were designing the barn we at first wanted to put in a bedded pack barn but sawdust was kind of hard to find or bedding was hard to find at the time so we steered away from that and decided to go with the water beds we can use a lot less bedding this way and still give that those cows that cushioning uh, that a pack would give them another technology that we utilize on the farm is a feed pusher uh, this robotic feed pusher will, will run once an hour and make a lap through our barn uh, pushing up feed uh, for the cows uh, we find that the feed pusher uh, is helpful in robotic cow flow uh, because when the feed gets pushed up it encourages cows to get up from the free stalls and, and the normal cycle for a robot cow is to get up, go eat, go get milked and lay back down. So the more times she gets up and eats, uh, the more frequently she'll uh, potentially decide to go get milk and that reduces the number of fetch cows that we have and, and balances out the amount of robot visits per hour throughout the day. So we actually have two robots on the farm. Uh, one does the milking, the other one pushes up feed. Uh, this is the Juno feed pusher. Um, so if cows don't eat and don't drink, they don't milk. And with our feeding system, we have it uh, drive-through feeding. Uh, traditionally, we'd have to come through here uh, multiple times in a day and push up uh, feed. The Juno does that for us now. It just, again, gives us that flexibility to stay out in the field or to be doing whatever other tasks that we have to be doing um, without worrying about pushing up feed. Uh, so we installed the cow brush, uh, the Lely Luna, uh, when we built the barn, just to kind of give the cows, cows get bored. Uh, they like to do stuff, scratch on stuff. Um, we like the idea of having the cow brush here. It lets the cows go and uh, get scratched, brushes them off. Uh, helps keep them a little bit cleaner and uh, a lot of times you'll see them come from the feed bunk they'll be lined up and come over here to the brush and then go from the brush to the robot. Uh, another feature of our barn is we chose to do kind of a, a unique hybrid barn uh, between tunnel ventilation and conventional uh, ventilation. Um, we chose this route to try and keep our barn from freezing in the winter time. Uh, we have eight 72 inch fans on one wall of the barn uh, that pulls the air from the other end of the barn down through the barn and blows it out. Uh, we took some wind tests whenever it was 90, I think 98 degrees this summer. Uh, we did some tests in here just to see if it was working. Uh, at the doors where the air is coming in, it was uh, six mile an hour wind. Um, at the stalls where the cows are laying, uh, we had a three mile an hour wind and down in front of the fans we had a five mile an hour wind. Um, and our temperature inside the barn was 10 degrees cooler uh, than outside, so it's doing what we want it to do. Um, with the hybrid, why I say we have a hybrid barn, uh, usually a tunnel ventilated barn has solid sides, meaning it don't have curtains that you can roll up or down. Uh, we sit, our farm sits on top of a hill and we get a lot of wind, so I like the idea of having 
the option to shut those fans down on windy days and open the curtains up and let the natural air blow through and, and cool the barn down. Um, and then in the winter time, we can close those curtains and close, shut the fans down. Uh, usually if it gets stuffy in here, we can kick one fan on uh, and keep the barn from freezing. opportunities to service agriculture uh, in the dairy industry um, we work with a lot of vendors we have people that um, help us with our food and nutrition we have people that uh, work as service providers and provide the maintenance for our robots uh, those technicians need to have a variety of skills um, a lot of engineering skills mechanical skills um, the ability to work uh, through electrical scenarios and plumbing. Uh, so most all of your construction trades are encompassed in a, a robot project. Um, we also have to maintain all that equipment. And uh, a lot of that we try to do ourselves, but uh, we also need some very skilled technicians to help us. In addition, we need people that are available to uh, deal with some of our unique computer situations uh, with the robots as well. Uh, some other careers uh, could include AI technicians. We have a armed service come and breed our cows every day. Uh, those are some really good paying jobs. And uh, we also have a hoof trimmer that comes once a month uh, to trim feet uh, on our cow. Okay, so that was our virtual tour for today. I hope that everybody had an enjoyable trip to both farms. And at this point in time, we will open it up for any questions that you may have. You can put questions either in the chat or you can unmute and ask questions for yourself. I do have some prepared questions ahead of time. So um, if you were still formulating some questions in your mind, um, that's great. Caitlin is monitoring the chat for us. Um, I had sent some questions to Mary Beth last night in preparation for today. Um, and some of the things that um, I was wondering about had to do with how the robot operates and communicates with you guys. Do you get any automatic notifications when a cow's off feed or off schedule, or do you have to go into the computer and check that? Uh, Joel, my husband, can check a lot of that mobily. Also, when you say notifications, um, there is a call system. Um, so perhaps a robot is offline. It hasn't been milking a cow for so many minutes. 
or there's some sort of an error. Um, there is a call tree set up. Um, perhaps we are the first call. Um, Joel's dad, who also still works uh, with the farm, um, maybe a second call, you know, then there's a third call until that alarm, quite honestly, is, is accepted um, and, and, and dealt with, I guess. So occasionally our phone, you know, does ring in the middle of the night um, because there's a problem with, uh, with one of the robots. Okay. And another question I had was, um, so is everything hardwired or does anything run off Wi-Fi for the robot system? We do have things that run off Wi-Fi. Uh, we do have a Wi-Fi system there at the farm. Um, Joel had indicated to me that the robots, we have nine robots um, at Albright Jerseys. When we um, started milking with robots, uh, we put eight online at the same time. And then um, we eventually added a ninth robot. The robots are connected with ethernet cable. Um, and then the collars um, that the cows wear also use, use some Wi-Fi. I think we have a question from Stu in the chat, which goes along with one of my questions as well, um, which I, I think Stuart's question was, how has energy consumption changed on the farm since adapting to the robot system? Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm, if I can answer that question real well. Um, uh, Jason, I don't know if you can help me out on that one or not um, in terms of energy consumption um, on the farm or, or not. Yeah, uh, you, you can phone a friend. Um, on average, when robots go in, you <laughs> see energy consumption go down um, because typically you're running less horsepower on your major energy consumers in the milking parlor. So there's less horsepower of vacuum pump running per day, which is probably the biggest motor on most dairy operations. You also typically have less horsepower for in cost and energy cooling because the milk is coming in slower. Um, it doesn't take as much energy to cool that milk. It spends more time going through some of the different uh, technology that uses water that is then recycled back to the cows. So plate coolers and then using free heaters. So it's because milk comes in slower, you actually recover more of that. So you have to spend less energy to heat water and to cool the milk. Um, so overall, now it's hard to do a straight up comparison on most farms because a lot of times when the robots go in, uh, you see other things get changed too in the ventilation systems or barns get added. And that changes the energy consumption compared to what the barn was doing before uh, as you add other technology to improve cow comfort. But on the milking side, energy consumption would usually go down. Thanks, Jason. Um, Thank one you. of the I had two, well, I guess I have two that pertain kind of to systems and maintenance, which was um, what's your generator backup system and what do you do if you have a water line issue? Um, in terms of a, a generator backup system, yes, we, we do have a generator backup system. Honestly, it was not operational um, when we started uh, with robots. We still had some more work to do um, to get that operational. It is now. Um, but we have a standby generator um, with an automatic transfer switch. At least that's for our three-phase service. And then we do still have some single-phase service that uh, runs off of a tractor generator. Um, in terms of a, a, a water line issue, I guess that would depend upon where it is. Um, I, I reviewed some of these questions with, with Joel last night. Um, that would obviously be, be an issue, but I think that's pretty situational in terms of how, how we would handle that in terms of where the water line issue would be. Um, a couple other questions. A Blue Sky Farm had told us that their milk goes to United Dairy for processing. Uh, where does Albright Jersey's milk go? Great question. Um, all, all of our milk goes to Middlefield Cheese, um, which is located on the east side of Cleveland. 
And uh, all of our Jersey milk goes into making Swiss cheese. You heard uh, Jason Workman talk a little bit about components of milk um, and uh, with, with the brown Swiss. And it seems like those brown cows just have a higher, higher components in some areas. And so our, our Jersey milk is uh, ideal for making cheese. I love cheese, so thank you for staying in business. <laughs> what would you say is the average production lifespan for your cows, say in years, and um, how many pounds of milk do you typically get from her in her time of service? That's one that I don't know that I can answer. Um, Jason may or may not be able to help me. Um, you know, I, I guess a disclaimer here, um, Whereas Leslie uh, works on the farm, I do work away from the farm. And so I often tell people I have enough knowledge to be dangerous. Um, and so some of the, the more technical questions I would need, probably Joel's help to answer some of those. Um, Jason, I'm not sure if you can help me out um, on that or not. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure where you guys are at. Um, you do see some of the farms when they switch to robots you actually see productive life increase um, just due to some different cow comfort things, mostly due to improved feet and legs because they're not standing in a holding area for two to three hours a day. So a lot of times you will see some feet and legs and reproductive, which are the two primary reasons cows are sold is feet and leg issues and then reproductive problems followed by utter mastitis disease problems along those lines. But um, you are starting to see some trends of increased productive life. Um, most operations are running somewhere. So they're about two years old when they calve. So about two to three lactation average on most farms. Um, there's some various reasons uh, why cows get career changes sooner than you may think, um, which we don't really need to get into, I guess, today. But on all operations, it can actually be an advantage to give a cow an early career change versus having her milk for 10 or 12 years. Um, each cow is different though. So most farms, go ahead, Mary Beth. I was going to say, Christine, you know, we did have some cows that, you know, Jason termed that a career change that when we went to a robotic system had to have a change in career just because they weren't good robot cows. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you saw that arm in the robot um, come under come under the cow, come under the udder. If we had some cows that had extremely low udders, sometimes there just wasn't the clearance for that arm to be able to get under that cow um, and effectively milk her. So there were a few cows um, that, that again had to, had, to had to go for the career change. Um, a few we sold to some, some local Mennonites um, but some um, just were not good robot cows. Um, I think you have a few robot dairies that may keep um, their parlor um, functioning um, and do some milking in their parlor. Um, we, we, we were not one of them. Everything uh, that's milked at, at our farm is milked via robot. So again, we, we did have to uh, get rid of some cows um, you know, when we went robotic. Yeah, career changes are, are often the things. And when it comes to those career changes, um, where what's your typical method of um, transitioning cows out of career? What do you do with your call cows? And what do you do with your bull calves? We have, in terms of the bull calves, we have um, several people you know, locally around that, uh, that for years has, has have taken our bull calves to raise them out. Um, granted, I think we don't have, I think I'm safe to say this, as many bull calves as we used to just because of the use of sex semen. Um, but we, uh, we try um, not to keep bull calves on the, on the farm very long, but we do have a number of, of local individuals that, uh, that want those uh, calves to raise out. Um, and call cows, I think, uh, a, a variety of things. Um, we have, again, a variety of people that perhaps Joel calls that can uh, we can move those on to. Excellent. Thank you. So we're at 931 here. 
And um, do we have any additional questions from the audience before we stop our recording for today? I'll give you a couple minutes to put those in the chat if you have any. Uh, but thank you so much, Mary Beth, Cheryl, Jason, for joining us on the breakfast this morning. It, it really adds a nice component to have you here with us. And um, once we get the recording posted, we'll be sure to share it with you. And if folks have questions that come up after the, the program ends, um, feel free to send them to Mary Beth or to myself or to Cheryl. Um, we can also pass messages on to Leslie. So we'll post the recording of the program on our county website, and we'll also post contact information there for any follow-up questions. Do we have any additional questions in the chat? Thank you so much for inviting us, Christine. I hope that everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. We will again have Farm Talk Breakfast next month. Um, it'll be the third Friday of the month, which is, let me check the date. I believe it's the 21st. It's the 18th, excuse me. December 18th, we'll have our next Farm Talk Breakfast. And our topic will be winter supplementation for beef cattle. And our speaker will be Chris Penrose of Morgan County. So uh, come back and see us again next month. Have a very happy Thanksgiving. And as always, if there's anything we can do for you here at Extension, feel free to reach out. And thank you again to our guests. Yeah, yeah. Oh.